this guy up. Okay, so I'm just here for like half a second. Um, okay, of course, you're crying, this Mr. Mr. Switch. Um, so I'm not gonna stay like, uh, um, barely great. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. That's the sad thing about this. Um, I'm gonna turn that up because I'm speaking a little bit quietly. We gonna turn this guy down. Uh, okay. Cool, 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 cool. My mic says I should be fine. Check now. That might be better. Um, okay, so here's... <laughs> Okay, okay. So, here's kind of the deal. I have no clue what I'm interested in doing right now. And I know that sounds bad because it kind of is bad. Um, so what are y'all interested in? <laughs> what are y'all interested in? Um, kind of seeing me do. And I'm going to have to turn off the mic in another second or two. I'm just here long enough to say hello, get things started, so that I can pull things up before we break things. Because I inevitably break things. <laughs> that is how I roll. So, um, we're gonna add some new Franker Face emotes, by the way, until I get monetized, in which case they're gonna slowly be pulled from Franker Face and, um, become monetization emotes. So, yeah. That being said, pick a game. Let's do something fun. I still have unboxing. I don't know what'll run well with the camera, so we're about to find out.
I apologize. I see that we're experiencing some lag issues. Mm, and probably help if I turn that down. Um. Yeah, it's coming across choppy in it. Oh my god, it's hard to view right there. No, 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 no. Ah, shysters. Alright, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> um. I mean, I can always turn down render distance. See, I can do all these fancy things normally. Because that's just how my computer runs. Y'all, this ain't pretty, is it? Oh, God. I can see it. Okay, this may not be it. Um, what I can do, though, is I'll bring us over here for a minute. <laughs> um, we'll give this time to kind of... Really, girl? Really, girlfriend? What is it? Come here. One sec. She's being sassy. I apologize. I'm actually gonna grab some clothes, work real quick, and we can just talk. See what's up. Um, I'll spill. Hold on. Whoop. I'll spill some tea. Not too much because I have to admit, the stuff I really want to share is actually really inappropriate for me to share right now. Um, Gary knows what I mean. So. Hit me with some questions, I guess. Truth or dare type stuff. And I don't do dares <laughs> often. Now, if you hit me with something innocent, maybe. But there's some stuff I don't do to protect my privacy. So, just keep me updated. Give me some stuff. Why does that say it's angry? Phone's fine. What's mad? Slimy bud, you still here? Because I got a question. You know technology better than I do. <laughs> better question. How are you, Otani? <laughs> I always say it like that, I guess, because of the game on the Wii, and that's what it reminds me of the most. And it's good to hear that you're here from Miracle Grow. Speaking of which, who wants to yell at Miracle Grow for me? <laughs> Because Grow is ignoring us. <laughs> nah, I, I kid, I kid. Um, Slime, I'm using the same webcam thing you told me to. Phone says it's angry. Never mind. It was saying CPU overloaded on the screen, and I don't know exactly what that means. Also, if this is a lower camera quality than last time, Get used to it. This is the mode where I can actually see what's happening instead of having to walk around the camera and go, Oh, here, fit this way. Which I can't do with myself as easy as I can with another person, like Gare. So, I'll be right back. Um, Okami? Yeah! <laughs> see, game. So, nah, y'all just, y'all just hit me with stuff. You don't have to ask me, just it hit me. Extremely sorry.
stay open. I'm a mess. I hope I'm y'all's favorite mess, but you know, I'll accept just being a mess. Woo! <laughs> okay. What kind of dog do I have? I have two different dogs. I have Mia. Mia is a treeing walker coon hound, and she has anxiety. And then we have Bentley. Bentley is a three-legged, <laughs> deaf, whippet beagle mix. And typically you'll see Bentley um, in my photos. He's the brown one, and we love them both to death. But he gets more popularity for his personality. Mia's kind of emo. All right. <laughs> what else? What else? I don't. I only have Chrome running on my phone. It just gets angry because it's old. It's not even that old. The battery is just always offended. Uh, it says it's fine now. I don't know why it was angry. Because it doesn't have to do with my computer at all. But it acted like it was mad at my computer. So I keep looking at the wrong camera. You can pose a random question to chat. Okay, okay. I mean, I'm not going to do that right the second because it'll stop this and it looks fine. But I'll definitely run that by before next time. Yeah, feel free to pose a random question. For anyone that's new here, Gary's kind of my partner in crime. Um, Gary's been on a stream or two, and... Well, a stream. Um, but just expect them to hang around. They're just a good guy. Gary's a girl. Just full disclaimer, so don't necessarily get wiped out by the name. I could live anywhere in the world. Where and why? See, that's a good question. It's a bit of a loaded question. Um, and that's simply because of some of the medical things I deal with. It makes it comfortable in the U.S., but at the same time, I'm the kind of person, I overanalyze everything. So, if I could live anywhere in the world. You know, there are a lot of places I'd want to visit. Um, I enjoy living where I live now. No shocker by my accent, I live in the Americas. Um, and I, I like where I live now. If I could visit anywhere, though, I really wish I could see Thailand, but I'm never gonna go, um, simply due to some allergies I deal with and medical things. Um, I really want to look all around Europe. England is like, God, I want to go to England so bad. I think that just sounds phenomenal to go visit. Uh, most of Europe... I love to visit places steeped in history or historic chapels. And I'm not even that religious. I'm sorry to anyone that is, you know, respect on y'all. But um, I love to visit historic chapels, places steeped in history. And I'm really sad um, that... Uh, 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 um... Oh my god, why can I not think of the name? Oh my god. Uh. I'm really sad that I'll never see the Notre Dame Cathedral. Um. At least in its, in its original glory. Um. The Notre Dame Cathedral was definitely a bucket list place for me. And it still is. But I don't feel that I'll ever get to see it as it originally was since it burned down. Um, yeah, so chat, here's, here's y'all's question. Uh, which place in Inazuma has the coolest building silhouette? Gary needs this for art purposes. Woo! <laughs> um, but yeah. I'm thinking Inazuma, it's not a building. My favorite... One of my absolute favorite places in, in Azuma has to be the Sacred Sakura. Um, Sakura. Sakura? I'm not saying either of those right, am I? We're not playing Christmas music, thank you. 
if I could have any pet in the world ever, what would it be and why? Ooh, see, I'm an animal lover, but that's not really a good thing. Um, any pet, see, unless it was bred for captivity, nothing except a dog. Like, animals that aren't supposed to be captive, you know, I won't keep captive. But, um, this doesn't really answer your question, but it's one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. We had three t triplet deer on our property, and they grew up around us. They actually grew up desensitized to humans, no matter what we do, everyone in the neighborhood knew. Um, and so, now we've hit a point where it's down to one. And she's wise. She knows to stay away from people. She knows to be wary, to stay safe. We've named her Rosemary. And she won't come eat from our hands like the babies did. She's an adult now. Um, but we put out corn for her. We feed her. And she runs from us. But when the dogs are outside and barking, she will come visit our backyard to see the dogs. So if we leave them out there for long enough, She'll come visit our yard to check on our dogs. And that is, she's not a pet. She's a wild animal, and I acknowledge that. But it's so special to have a connection with an animal like that, that you don't expect um, for you to have. Deer are always seen to be, you know, wild or hunted or this or that, or meals for some people. Um... But we just know that she's safe on our property. And so we just give her some corn here and there and make sure that she stays safe. So, um, yeah. I have pet a deer. I actually got to pet the triplets. Um, now granted, we weren't really supposed to because what happens when you pet them is kind of like other animals. Um... Sometimes their parents won't come back for them. It's not good for them. They get desensitized to humans. But the entire neighborhood knew at this point, and it was he, it was a he. He was eating out of our hands and kept bumping our hands to, um, to get us to feed him, and it just kind of happened that way. Biggest regret in life so far. That's loaded. Um, that's actually a really loaded question right now. Um, there's a lot going on to where I debated whether or not I would even come back this week. Um, so I'm trying not to focus on regrets. I know that's a really bad answer, but I'm trying to not focus on the past and instead look at the future a little bit more. And that's really difficult for me. I tend to marinate in the past knowing that if we fail to remember and recognize the past, we are doomed to repeat it in the future. It's something that I believe is happening in the world right now, and it's why I have to sit and marinate and think to a high degree about all of my actions. And that's why, because of that, I know I can be a very petty person. I have made some very bad decisions in my life. And to be honest, I don't feel comfortable answering that. Um, because not only would it put me in a bad mind space, but I also think that it would reveal some things about my past character that shaped me now. Um, but that would not be respected and would not be appropriate. And y'all may not understand why it changed me into who I am now, and I don't feel like explaining or justifying that you know I feel like you know what I mean <laughs> so I'm gonna keep rolling um rest of y'all hit me with some stuff Okami you're new here um throw out some questions get to know me things that other people might know and you don't um slimy you too you're chill canvas um throw out some questions Gary, if you remember something interesting I've told you, ask it so I can start a story. Um, but yeah, so, so that's kind of that. And if there's other stuff like that, I'll be like, hey, not right now. 
Um, like, I'll tell y'all directly. Just got out of a relationship. You can ask me relationship questions, but don't ask me about how that one ended. Um, that was one of those shame on me moments. Oh, oh, my favorite stuffy. Ugh, stabbed to the heart. All of them. <laughs> um, but I do have... So this is Barley. I'll name them for you. Barley, Hubble, Beanie, that's a plant. Sushi, never name the dumpling. Uh, the Corgi is Sushi. This is Stitch, Bulbasaur. Um, and Pua's back there somewhere. Pua's way back there from Moana. I have an especially strong connection with Pua. Um, Pua's been my bud. He's been there, um, for me for absolutely forever. And I love my little bud. He's, every single relationship I've been through, every rocky patch that I've been through, Pua's been there. Which I know seems weird, because Moana's relatively new. 2016, I think. Um, and getting the guy was, he's relatively new. But since I got him, he has been my ultimate go-to. He's just been, he's been phenomenal for me. Robotics. Robotics. Um, we have events next week for the team. Uh, I'm not going to get into them, though, sadly. Because they share about my personal location, my age, all that sort of fun stuff. Um... So, I mean, you're on an account where you see some private stuff that the rest of these people don't see. That's chill. All you gotta know, I'm involved with a first team. Uh, first Robotics. I won't share my involvement. Um, that's not true. I'm, I'm a mentor figure to the team. Um, and I'm involved with a local first team. And that's all I'm really gonna share. First Robotics. Uh, look it up. F-I-R- ST, my favorite organization, love them to death and what they stand for. Um, so, I mean, I'll tell you more about that privately. Chill. Stuffy names. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hi, small human. I'm only calling you that because that's what you're referred to in chat. And I don't want to give away your personal information. So, every little stuffy has a story behind it. Um, this is, oh my god, what is your name? Blubby! This is Blubby! Blubby, I just love. He was named by me and one of my exes, because my ex gave him to me. Um, Barley was a creature in a D&D &D campaign. He was a giant rideable badger that I could do in a D&D &D campaign. And so Barley was what I decided to name him because it just felt right. Um, that's okay. Thank you for stopping by, Okami. Um, Hubble, I love space. I love everything about space. Um, I got Hubble when I was with uh, my first sex, and I love, love, love space, and so did he, so we named him Hubble, this little guy. Beanie was named by my most recent ex because we just decided to name him together because the bee is adorable. Um, Pua from Moana kept the name. Sushi, I named my corgi Sushi because I remember one of my favorite corgis that I followed online, real life corgis, like Instagram corgi, was named Waffles. And I went, oh, I want a fun name for a corgi. Like, I like naming them after food. I don't know why. I just do. And I'm like, you know what? Sushi fits. Um, and I think that's all the ones that I have around me right now that I've named. But typically, it just kind of comes to me. I have creme brulee sitting over there. It's a giant teddy bear. Um, I have caramel on my bed because caramel is the color of caramel. Um, and I have Bolt from the movie Bolt. Um, I think I have, I think I have, they're so cool. Sorry, ADHD, I read your message, yes. Um, 
Who else do I have? Came with the name, came with the name, original names. I actually, strangely enough, you would think I would name more of them than I do. I don't. <laughs> um, these are some of the special guys, and I love them. And sometimes a name just feels right. I'm a writer, so sometimes the name just fits. What's next? What's next? <laughs> I'm really enjoying this. Uh, since my computer's decided it's just gonna not. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm childish. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. What sports am I into? Um, I don't watch a lot of sports. I don't play a lot of sports. That being said, I go to a kickboxing gym. Or... A gym that involves kickboxing elements in it. That has to be one of my favorite things on this planet. Um, it's a great way to help deal with anger. Um, and so knowing me and all the drama that kind of falls into my lap. Um, it's a great way for me to process that. And so I really, really, really love going to a kickboxing gym. I actually have my wraps over there. And I can show you how I wrap my hands, if you're interested. Um, but yeah, so let me grab some wraps and I can show you how it works. I have my gloves too, so. I'm gonna cover, cause my name is on them. These are my gloves. Um, but yeah. And then, <laughs> These are my wraps. So, you want to flatten them first. Thank you. I'm glad you like the shirt. I like the shirt. It's brand new. <laughs> we just went shopping yesterday, and I got it. So, um, wrap. You start here. It says this side down. You're going to take it, go one around your wrist. Keep it tight-ish, but don't cut off circulation. Two, three. I have my wrist secured, so I'm going to pull it up across the palm of my hand and across my knuckles for one, two, three. Keep your fingers spread here to make sure that you're not restricting them. That'll be important later. Now that you have your knuckles covered, you're going to bring it down towards your wrist, wrap it around your wrist once, and then so down, wrap, and then over your thumb. I'm trying to show, I'm having issues finding out how to show it. So it's like this. I'm going to bring it around the back of my thumb, up and over, like so. Wrap, and then do it the opposite way. So up and over, wrap. I'm pulling this. Um, and then from there, I take it and we're going to go in between the fingers. So you're going to grab this bit, pull it between your pinky and your ring finger, loop under the thumb between your middle and your ring finger, back under the thumb again, and between your middle and your index finger, back by the thumb the last time. Wrap it by your wrist, bring it up, wrap one, two, as many times as you can get around your knuckles. I actually think I did that poorly. We're going to see. Pull, down, up, one, two. Nah, this is just the short wrap. All right, so I got it across my knuckles like so. And then we're going to add the Velcro. And there it is. Fully secured. Boxing wrap. No pain on my wrist, hence me hitting it. So my wrist is nice and secured. My knuckles are secured. It runs in between my fingers, which isn't necessary, but I prefer. And yeah, so that's how I wrap my wrist for the gym. 
<laughs> I know that was a little bit lengthy, but I thought I'd showcase it. So, in case you're wondering, that's the wraps. No, 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 not going pro. Um, <laughs> that's the wraps. And then as for what you do after that, then you just pull on the glove. And this is only for use on the bags. Again, covering my name, privacy reasons. Um, for use on the bags. And, um, for use on, so this will be your push-ups, your sit-ups, your speed bag, which is this bag. Da -da 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 it's on a triplet uh, speed. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and you hit it on the three every time. Um, that's your sit-ups. That's your planks. That's your uh, weightlifting. We do, I think they have me doing like Arnold presses and stuff. Um, jump rope, they'll have us do. And then for your bags, you put on your gloves and the long hanging bag depends on what kind of workout it is. Sometimes it'll be a weight workout. Uh, sometimes it'll be a kick workout. Sometimes you'll need your punches. So, humor me, y'all. This is where things get a spicy. Um, let me clean this up behind me first. I think. Hold. What's up, guys? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Oh, my blood poppies. Sorry. So this is where it gets fun. Oh. Y'all get to see more than usual. You've got me started on the gym. <laughs> um, so when your hands are wrapped like this, that's when you'll do, it's fun to see my form. That's when you'll do like, like I said, your low planks, your sit-ups, anything like that. So plank and hold. This is fun. Not really. <laughs> um, like I said, your sit-ups. Okay, that's close. One, two, three, so on and so forth. I'm weak, and that's a cramp in my leg. But that's what you use that for as opposed to your uh, glove gloves. <laughs> also, if you haven't seen all of this, I apologize if it's not what you were expecting. <laughs> I am me, and I am not sorry for being me. But if it's not what you wanted and not why you're here, go somewhere else. I'm sure you can find someone cute somewhere else. Not to say I'm not, just to say people have their types. If I ain't yours, leave. <laughs> or don't. You Y'all get the message. I'm bad with words. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, I've also gotten recommendations to do book reading streams. I don't know if y'all would like that. <laughs> um, I think it's a bit of an easier take on what I normally do. And considering my voice for when I'm like, I missed live like this versus when I'm reading, when I'm reading, it takes on a softer tone. Um, but when I'm, when I'm live like this and I need to not really get my point across, but it's just, it's a different timbre of speaking. It's not me intentionally putting on a voice. It's just kind of how it works. Um, I have a few different options. I can read a short story from Leigh Bardugo's books. Let me see. I have some short stories. Language of Thorns has a bunch of different books or stories in it. And here's my pride and joy. If you don't know who Leigh Bardugo is, uh, watch Six of Crows, or it's not Six of Crows, it's uh, Shadow and Bone on Netflix. It combines the Shadow and Bone trilogy and the Six of Crows uh, duology. Phenomenal, may I say. Um, so this has different folklore stories 
from Zamini to Ravka to Kirch to Fierda. Or, sorry, Ketterdam to Fierda. Fierda? Anyways. Um, if those don't sound familiar, they're from her Grisha trilogy stories. The Grisha verse. Um, so this is Language of Thorns. So, do we want to start with this, and then, if you don't like it, we can always move to something else? Because I can start with... What's one of my favorites in here? We have... I personally like... The Too Clever Fox, or The Soldier Prince. The Too Clever Fox is good... But I think we'll start with the Soldier Prince. Okay. Yeah. We can do that. Um. So we're going to do... The Soldier Prince. Is there even a section for reading on Twitch? I don't think there is. Is there? I don't think so. So we're going to stay in just chatting. Enter tags. Okay. There we go. So, we're going to do a reading stream. Um, I might start now. I might have to break away in the middle of it. We'll see. I might have to break away early in it. We'll just see. Is the music too loud? Okay. Ready? The Soldier Prince. Part of Language of Thorns by Leigh Bardugo. In the end, the clocksmith was to blame. But Mr. and Mrs. Zelverhouse should not have let him into the house. This is the problem with even lesser demons. They come to your doorstep in velvet coats and polished shoes. They tip their hats and smile and demonstrate good table manners. They never show you their tales. The clocksmith was called Droessen, though there were rumors he was not Kirch, but Ravkin, an exiled nobleman's son, or possibly a disgraced fabricator banished from his homelands for reasons unknown. His shop was on Windstrat, where the canal crooked like a finger beckoning you closer. Crooked like a finger beckoning you closer. And he was known the world over for his fantastical timepieces, for the little bronze birds that sang different songs at every hour, and for the tiny wooden men and women who played out amusing scenes at midnight and then again at noon. He'd risen to fame when he built a clockwork fortune teller that when a certain lever was pulled would move its polished wooden hand over your palm and predict your future. A merchant brought his daughter to the shop before her wedding. The fortune teller had clicked and clanked, opened its wooden jaws and said, 
you will find great love and more gold than you could wish for. He brought the clever automaton for his beloved child as a wedding gift, and everyone who attended the celebration agreed they'd never seen a bride and groom more in love. Sound for what? For the actual stream? I'm sorry. Slimy, would you mind clearing that up with Ricey if there's an issue? In the meantime, um, but the ship his daughter boarded to begin her honeymoon was so heavily weighted with goods and coin that it sank at the first breath of a storm and all were lost to the uncaring sea. When the news reached the merchant, he remembered the automaton's clever words and drunk on misery and brandy, smashed the thing to bits with his own fists. <laughs> Sorry. I was I was reading the chat. <laughs> His servants found him lying amid the wreckage the next day, still weeping, shirt stranded, knuckles bloody. But the sad tale drew new customers to the clocksmith's store in search of the marvelous and uncanny. In his shop they found many wonders, tawny golden lions who hunted mechanical gazelles across a velvet belt, a garden of enamel flowers pollinated by jeweled hummingbirds that whirred and buzzed on wires so thin they truly seemed to be flying, a rotating calendar clock kept on the highest shelf away from curious young eyes, Populated by a human automata. Automata? Automata? Hold on. Hey! No! No, 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 You jump on that, seriously. Please, don't jump in the frame. Oh dear, I'm sorry. The dog jumped on the counter. <laughs> Move. He's deaf. This is how we scold him. I'm sorry. <laughs> Moving on, back to the red... Back to the regularly scheduled stream. God. <laughs> um. I'm going to read that section again. <laughs> in the shop, in his shop, they found many wonders. Tawny golden lions who hunted mechanical gazelles across a velvet belt. A garden of enamel flowers pollinated by jeweled hummingbirds that whirred and buzzed on wires so thin they truly seem to be flying. A rotating calendar clock, kept on the highest shelf away from curious young eyes, populated by human automata who committed different ghastly murders every month. On the 1st of January, a duel was fought on an icy field, puffs of smoke emerging from the combatants' pistols with tiny pops, tinny pops, like tin. In February, a man climbed atop his wife, to strangle her as her lover cowered beneath the rumple bed, and so on. Despite his accomplishments, Joessen was still a young man, and he became a coveted party guest among the merchant families who served as his customers. He dressed well, conversed pleasantly, and always bought charming gifts to his brought charming gifts to his host. It was true that when he entered a room, the people there would find themselves shifting uneasily on their feet rubbing their arms at the sudden chill, wondering if a door somewhere needed closing. Yet, somehow, it only made him more interesting. Without that sense of the unwholesome, Joessa might have been a pathetic character, a grown man fiddling with what were little more than elaborate toys. Instead, there was much talk of his smart velvet coat and his nimble white fingers. Mamas clutched their handkerchiefs and daughters blushed when he was near. Every winter, the Zelverhouses, a wealthy family of tea merchants, 
hosted the clocksmith at their country home for the parties and entertainments given during the week of Nachtel. 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 I apologize. Here's what I didn't account for when I began reading. Most of these words, if not made up, are Russian. I cannot pronounce Russian words. Nopshto? Not, not, not. Uh, let me type it out. This is, y'all think I'm insane right now? Knock, not, not. N-A-C-H-T. That, that, my friends, is what I'm attempting to say. Knock, spell. Knock, knock. I'm sure it's harsher than that. The house itself was a model of merchant restraint. All dark wood, stolid brick, and hard lines. But it was perfectly situated by a lake that froze early for skating, and it was effusive, effusive, eff I swear I can read. In its comforts, with fireplaces alight in every room to keep the house always snug and merry, and every floor polished to the warm syrup shine of a glazed cake. From the very first year, Joesson visit visited the house by the lake. Troubling rumors followed. During his first day, the Zelver House's neighbors, the De Cloets, were mourning through Noxbell and into the new year after Elise de Cloet gave birth to a baby composed entirely of dandelion fluff. When a careless maid opened a window, it blew away at the first gust. The next year, one of the Zelver House cousins had a bloom of little gray mushrooms break out over her forehead and a boy visiting from Liege claimed he'd woken to find a single wig jutting from beneath his shoulder blades, but that it had burned to ash when he passed through a sunbeam in the hall. Were these strange occurrences linked to the clocksmith? No one could be certain, but they whispered about it. That young man, Droessen, is a charming fellow, but most unusual, and peculiarities seemed to follow him. A woman once said to Altea Zelberhaus. Most unusual, Altea agreed, but she knew that Droessen accepted few imitations, and that this woman with her fussy lace collar could only hope Droessen might someday make an appearance at one of her salons. So Altea smiled, repeated, most unusual indeed, and left it at that. It all seemed harmless at the time. Droessen was not just unusual in his talents or his habits, but also in his greed. He had spent his life tinkering in corners, bowing and scraping to the merchants who graced his door, and he had learned that talent was not enough. When he realized customers preferred to buy from handsome faces, he had his hair cut into a fashionable style and made himself a set of even white teeth so fine that they sometimes fooled even him. When he saw the respect his patrons gave military men, he'd worn a painful brace to correct his stoop, and the shoulders of his jackets padded so that he could affect a soldier's upright bearing. Because he discerned that popularity was dependent upon demand, he made sure to refuse two out of every three imitations. But he grew tired of eating cold dinners in his darkened shop. The doors locked and the lights turned off to create the illusion that he was somewhere having fun. He wanted a grand house instead of a dank, rented room. He wanted money for his inventions. He wanted to have to say, yes sir, no sir. He never wanted to have to say, yes sir, no sir, right away sir, again. So he would have to marry well. But whom could he make his bride? The young women of marriageable age who came to his shop with their fathers and flirted with him at parties saw him as a bit of a danger. They would never take a mere tradesman seriously as a prospect. No, he needed a girl. Still malleable. One that he could make 
admire him. Clara Zilverhouse was not yet twelve then, lovely enough, rich enough, and of just the dreamy disposition he required. He would learn her wants and wishes. He would deliver them to her, and in time, she would come to love him for it. Or so he thought. Joessa knew the properties of every kind wood and paint and liqueur. He could finesse the gears of a clock until they spun with silent precision. I will be right back. I apologize for the break. I need to break away for a second, and I will be back shortly.
Okay. I am back. I am back with food. Um. Um. I also. Eh, sorry. You probably can't hear them, but I also apologize. There are fireworks. Um. At least I hope they're fireworks. So. I apologize. I'll see if I can get through this story tonight. And then, mm, if I get a more regular schedule, I may read bigger books. Meantime, how are you enjoying it so far? Slimy dude, you're fine. I expected to read you to sleep. <laughs> mm. And I know if Rice is still here, he's probably gonna pop out eventually. Mm. <laughs> Rice, are you still here, bud? Don't remember. Okay. Where were we? I'm going to repeat some of what we've already read. Uh, just, yeah. <laughs> because it makes the most sense. Joessa knew the properties of every kind of wood and paint and liqueur. He could finesse the gears of a clock until they spun with silent precision. And yet, though he could smile readily, charm easily, and play the parts of a gentleman, he had never truly understood the people or the workings of their steady running but inconstant hearts. I'll make sure it does. The house by the lake bustled with excitement whenever the clocksmith arrived, and the children were always first to greet him when he emerged from his coach. They would trail after the house servants who unloaded his luggage, the trunks and chests invariably filled with splendid objects, dolls in the costumes of the Comédie Brute, music boxes, rows of cannons, and even a grand castle to defend. And though young Frederick liked to stage long battles, he would eventually grow bored, no matter how finely they made the tiny armaments and troops, and put on his coat to go find mischief in the snow. Clara was different. To Droessen's dismay, she ignored the elaborate clockworks and mechanicals he brought her, and spared only a small smile for the exquisite replica of a Ravkin palace with its carved wooden arches and domes plated in real gold. But she could play for hour upon hour with the dolls that he made, vanishing into the house and only emerging when the dinner bell had been rung. More than once, and her mother had been forced to shout up the stairs and down every corridor for Clara to cease her make-believe and come be fed. So over many long nights in the workshop, Droessen made for her an elegant, pale-eyed nutcracker with a bright blue coat and shiny black boots and a wicked little bayonet tucked into one blocky fist. "'You must tell him all your secrets,' said Droessen as he placed the doll in Clara's arms, "'and he will keep them safe for you.' She promised that she would. Clara's mother and father assumed that as she grew older, Clara would leave such childish things behind and begin to care for more dresses and the prospect of a husband and a family, and as her friends did. But as the years passed, Clara stayed the same strange, dreamy girl who might let a sentence trail off because some secret, unspoken thought had caught her, who would endure language lessons and cotillations with distracted grace and then smile and drift off to some dim corner where whatever invisible world her mind had conjured might unfurl without distraction. When Clara turned sixteen, her parents threw her a grand party, 
She ate sweets, teased her brother, and danced beautifully with every eligible merchant's son in attendance. Altea's overhouse heaved a happy sigh of relief and went to bed without a worry for the first time in months. But that night, when she woke from her sleep, she had the sudden need to check on her children. Frederick, seventeen and happy to be home from school, snored loudly in his room. Clara's bed was empty. Altea found Clara curled on her side by the hearth in the dining room, one of her favorite dolls in her arms. She saw that her daughter had put on her slippers and coat, and were both wet with snow. Clara, her mother whispered, rocking her shoulder gently to rouse her from her sleep. Why did you go outside? Clara blinked drowsily at her mother and smiled a sweet, vague smile. He loves the snow, she said, then clutched her doll closer and fell back into slumber. Altea looked down at her daughter in her nightgown and damp coat, the ugly little face of the wooden doll in her arms. It was Altea's least favorite of Droessen's creations, a nutcracker with a grotesque smile and a garish blue coat. Standing there, she had the sudden thought that inviting the clocksmith into her home years ago had been a terrible mistake. Her fingers itched to snatch the doll from Clara and toss the wretched thing into the fire. She reached for the nutcracker, then yanked her hand back. For a moment, it could not be, and yet she was not sure of it. It seemed the toy soldier had turned his square head to look at her and there had been sorrow in his eyes. Nonsense, she told herself, cradling her hand to her chest. You are becoming as fanciful as Clara. Even so, she stepped away, certain that if she dared to touch the nutcracker, or dared to throw it into the flames, the thing would cry out. Or worse, it might not burn at all. She put a blanket over her daughter and returned to her own bed, and when she woke the next morning, she'd forgotten all about her foolish notions of the night before. Nakshbel was beginning, and her guests would soon arrive. She rose and rang for tea, seeking fortification for the arduous day ahead. But when she went downstairs to see the menus, she checked to make sure that Clara was sorting chestnuts with the cook, and paused once by the cabinet in the dining room where they displayed Joessen's gifts. Not for any reason, really. Certainly not to make sure that the nutcracker was safely locked away behind the glass. Clara knew her mother worried. She worried, too. When she was seated at dinner or some party with a friend or even occasionally at her lessons, she would think, This is pleasant. This is enough. But then she'd arrive back home and she'd find herself in the dining room in front of the cabinet. She'd reach once more for the nutcracker and take him to her bedroom or up to the attic where she would lie on her side amidst the dust motes and whisper to him until he whispered back. It always took some time and felt a bit awkward at the start. It had been easier when she was a child, but she was self-conscious now in a way that she hadn't been then. Clara felt foolish moving the nutcracker's arms, making his jaw open and close to answer her questions. She couldn't help but see herself as others would, a young woman, nearly grown, lying on a dusty attic floor, talking to a doll. But she persisted, reminding him of the adventures they'd had, though she, though they had changed a bit over the years. You are a soldier. You fought bravely on the front and returned to me, your darling. You killed a monster for me once, a rat with seven heads on the last evening of Nakshbel. You are a prince. I awoke from a curse with a kiss. I loved you and no other would, and you chose me for your queen. She would place a walnut between his hard teeth, then crack the noise so loud in the still attic. Are you my soldier? She would ask again and again. Are you my prince? Are you my darling? Are you mine? And at last, sometimes after mere moments, Sometimes after what seemed like forever, Georges would move and he would speak. Are you my soldier? I am. Are you my prince? I am. 
As he spoke, his limbs would grow, his chest would broaden, and his skin would turn supple. Are you my darling? I am. Are you mine? Sweet Clara, the nutcracker would say, tall and handsome and perfect now. The grotesque rictus of his face softened into tender human lines. Of course I am. He would offer his hand, and with a whoosh they would fly out the attic window into the cold. She would find herself atop a great white horse, clutching her beloved's waist, whooping with joy as they sailed through the night past the clouds and into the lands beyond. She did not know what to call the place he brought her to. Fairyland? The land of dreaming? When she was a child, it looked different. They had ridden a spun sugar boat on a sweet water stream. She'd walked on marzipan cobblestones, past gingerbread villages and castles made of marmalade. Children had danced for them and greeted the Nutcracker as their prince. They'd sat on gun gumdrop cushions, and his mother had called Clara a hero. Now much of that was gone, replaced by deep green forests and shining rivers. The air was warm and silken like all the places she'd read about. Summer lands where the sun shone all year and the balmy breezes were thick with the scent of orange blossoms. The white horse carried them to new places every time. A valley where wild ponies with manes of mist ranged. A quicksilver lake as big as a sea where they met with dashing pirates who had gems for teeth. A palace of dogwood walls and large spur towers that rose from a grove where clouds of butterflies hovered, wings chiming like bells. The queen there had pale green skin, perpetually dotted with dew, and her crown rose like antlers, directly from her forehead, and twists of bone that gleamed like mother of pearl. When she touched her lips to Clara's mouth, she spent the day flying, swooping, and dropping like a hummingbird, pausing only to drink honey wine, and let the queen twine hellbore into her hair. Yet it was not enough. Did her prince love her? Could he? Why did he return her home at the end of every magical journey? It wasn't fair to show her that such a world could exist, and then take it from her so cruelly. If he loved her as she loved him, surely she would be allowed to stay. At every visit, she hoped his mother would greet her as a daughter rather than a guest, that she would open a new door on a, we on a wedding bower. Instead, the dinner gong would sound, or she'd hear Frederick stomping up the stairs, or her mother's voice calling, and she would find herself sailing back through the starry sky to the cold, empty attic, her joints stiff from lying on the slots of the attic floor, the hard body of the nutcracker beside her, shrunken and ugly, the leavings of walnuts between his wooden jaws. She would place him back in the cabinet and return to her parents. She would try to smile at the drab world around her, Though her cheeks were still warm with sunshine, though her tongue was still sweet with the taste of honey wine. Whew. Forgive me for a second. As for the nutcracker, he was sure of nothing, and sometimes it frightened him. His memories were a blur. He had known their had been a battle, many battles, and that he'd fought bravely. Hadn't he been made for it? He had been born with a bayonet in hand. He fought for her. But where was she now? Where was Clara? She of the star eyes and the soft hands. They'd faced the Rat King together. She'd wrapped him in her kerchief. He'd bled into its white lace folds. Clara. Why could he remember her name and not his own? He'd fought bravely, at least he thought he had. The details were difficult to recall. The screams, the blood, the squealing of the rats with their thick pink tails and teeth and like, like yellow knives, gums red with blood from the bites they'd taken. How those teeth had glistened in the golden light. Had it been sunrise or sunset? He remembered the smell of pines. He squinted now from his place in the barracks, though the wide plate glass through the wide plate glass window. But the view confused him too. He could see a long table set for a feast, candied fruit, pine boughs, 
laid upon the mantel, but everything was far too large, as if seen through a distorting lens. He counted the brass buttons on his fine blue coat. Whose uniform did he wear? Which country was his home? Who had polished the dust of the battlefield from his boots? Had there been a battle? Had he fought bravely or only dreamed of fighting? Other memories seemed clearer. He was a prince, her prince. She told him so. He wanted nothing more than to show her all the wonders of his home, to explore its endless horizons. And yet, why did he feel no gladness when he returned to the palace where he supposed he had been raised? Why was everything as new to him as it seemed to be to her? Nothing felt certain. He was sure the streets they'd walked had been narrow before, bordered by houses with frosted roofs instead of wide boulevards that swept past mansions tiled in gold. Gifts of nougat and sweet cream had pleased Clara before, but now he gave her jewels and gowns because he knew she would prefer them. How he came by this knowledge, he could not fathom. He watched the people at the table, giants it seemed, and yet there was Clara, who he'd held in his arms. Sometimes her eyes strayed to him, and he tried to cry out to her, but he had no voice, no way to move his limbs. He must have been injured. He watched her eat supper and speak to... It took him a minute to remember. Frederick, her brother, a commander in the war, bold and sometimes reckless, but the nutcracker had executed every order given. There was another familiar place face at the table, a man with long hair and pale blue eyes, who studied Clara as if she were a piece of machinery to be taken apart and put back together. I know him, thought the nutcracker. Droessen, I know his name. But he could not think how. The man did not look like a soldier, though he had the bearing of one. A memory clawed up through the nutcracker's thoughts. He was lying on his back, staring at shelves packed with clocks and slumped marionettes. He smelled paint and oil, the fresh shavings of wood. Joessen loomed over him, huge and cold-eyed, with terrible focus. I was wounded, thought the nutcracker. Joessen must be a surgeon, then. But that wasn't quite right. The meal ended. The guests drank little glasses of garnet-colored liquid. Clara slipped at hers, cheeks flushed. They played games before the fire, and someone shouted, It's snowing! They raced together around the great window, but the nutcracker could not see well enough to tell what interested them so. There was talk and laughter, and they were all racing out of the dining room to... He did not know. He did not know what lie beyond this room. It might be a palace or a prison, or a pine grove. He only knew that they were gone. Servants came and banked the fire, doused the candles. He'd fought bravely, and yet somehow he always ended up here, alone in the dark. Clara did not come that night. The nutcracker awoke to shrill squeaking and found the rat king at his bedside. He sat up hurriedly and reached for his saber, realizing as he grasped the, the sword at his sword belt that his weapon was gone, and at the same time that he could move again. Peace, Captain, the Rat King said. I have not come to fight, only to talk. His voice was high and reedy. Well, I guess I got that wrong. And his whiskers twitched, yet the monster still managed to look grave when he spoke. The creature had the nutcracker's blood on his filthy paws, and he would have murdered Clara, too. But if he came to speak under the conditions of a truce, the nutcracker supposed he must honor that. He dipped his chin in the barest about. The Rat King adjusted his felt cloak and looked around. I will now speak in the Rat King's high-pitched voice. D do you have anything to drink? If only they'd stuck you in a liquor cabinet, eh? <laughs> cabinet? The nutcracker frowned at the word. He'd been resting in the barracks, said he not? And yet, 
As he looked around, he saw that he had simply seemed the vague shapes of beds, and the other soldiers were strange items indeed. Girls with glass eyes and stiffly curled hair were propped against the wall. Rows of soldiers with bayonets at their shoulder, shoulders marched in frozen lockstep. I, I don't know, he replied at last. The Rat King perched on the gilded lip of an enormous music box. But was it enormous, or, or are they small? When was the last time you ate? he asked. The Nutcracker hesitated. Had it been with Clara, in the Land of Snow, the Court of Flowers? I, I, I can't recall. The Rat King sighed. You should eat something. I do eat. Sure, surely he did. Something other than walnuts. The Rat King scratched behind his ear with his little pink claws, then removed the crown from his gray head and placed it gently in his lap. Do you know I started life as a sugar mouse? The Nutcracker's confusion must have shown, as for the Rat King continued. I realize that it's hard to believe, but I was just a confection. Not even for eating, just for looking at. A charming little marvel, a testament to my maker's skill. It seemed a shame that I should go untasted. My first thought was, I wish someone would eat me. But that was enough. Enough for what? To get free of the cabinet. Wanting is why people get up in the morning. It gives them something to dream of at night. The more I wanted, the more I became like them. The more real I became. I am perfectly real, protested the Nutcracker. The Rat King looked at him sadly, sitting there without his crown in the dim light. His whiskers drooping slightly, he looked less like a dreadful monster than a sweet-faced mouse. A memory came to the Nutcracker. You had seven heads, the Rat King nodded. Clara imagined me fearsome, so fearsome I became. But a rat can't live with seven heads always talking and arguing. It took us hours to make the simplest decisions, so when the others were asleep, I cut them from me, one by one. There was an awful amount of blood. He shifted slightly in his seat. Who are you when she isn't here, Captain? I, I am... He wavered. I am a soldier. Are you? What is your rank? Lieutenant? Lieutenant, of course, answered the Nutcracker. Or is it Captain? The Rat Queen King inquired. Are you my soldier? Are you my prince? I... Surely you must know your rank. Are you my darling? Who are you when no one picks you up to hold you? Asked the Rat King. When no one is looking at you or whispering to you, who are you then? Tell me your name, soldier. Are you mine? The Nutcracker opened his mouth to answer, but he could not recall. He was Clara's prince, her protector. He had a name, of course he had a name, only the shock of battle had driven it from his mind. He'd fought bravely. He'd taken Clara to meet his mother. He'd ridden a horse through a gleaming field of stars. He was heir to nothing. He, he was a prince of a marzipan palace. He slept on spun sugar. He slept on gold. You walk and talk and laugh when Clara dreams with you, said the Rat King. But those are her desires. They cannot sustain you. My life, but sweet Jesus, he talks for a minute. Oh, no. <clears throat> <coughs> I apologize. That is a hard voice to keep up. Holy crap. Give, give me a minute, please. Oh. Rat King monologue time. Ooh. You walk and talk and laugh when Clara dreams with you, said the Rat King. But those are her desires. They cannot sustain you. My life began with wanting something for myself. I wish to be eaten. Then I wish to eat. A piece of cake, a bit of bacon, a sip of wine. I wanted these things from their table. That was when I moved my legs and blinked my eyes. I wanted to see beyond the cabinet door. That was when I found my way into the walls. There I met my rat brothers. They are not charming or pretty, but they live even when no one is looking. I have made a life in the walls with them, unwatched and undesired. I know who I am without anyone there to tell me. But why did you attack us? said the Nutcracker. The blood. 
the screaming. I know that was real. As real as anything. When Clara was a child, she dreamed of heroes, and heroes require a foe. But the desire to conquer was the will she gave me, not my own. It is simple hunger that keeps me alive now. Crumbs from the cupboard, cheese in the larder. A chance to venture outside to the woodpile. See the wide sky. Feel the cold bite of snow. Snow. Another memory emerged. Not the place of dreaming that Clara so longed for, but a new place beyond the cabinet. She had taken him outside one night. He had felt cold. He had seen clouds moving over the starlit sky. He had taken the air into his lungs, felt them expand, exhaled, seen the puff of his breath in the chill night. He remembered trees clustered against the horizon, a road, the desperate desire to see what lay beyond it. That's it, Captain, said the Rat King, as he slowly rose and placed the crown back atop his head. It helps to live in the shelter of the walls, where there are no human eyes to look upon me. It helps to be a rat, who no one wants to look at. Your desire must be stronger if you wish to get free of the cabinet, if you wish to be real. She loves you, though, and that will make it harder. Clara loved him, and he loved her, didn't he? The Rat King nudged open the cabinet door. One last thing, he said as he skittered onto the ledge. Beware, Droessen. You were meant to be a gift to Clara, a means of enchanting her and nothing more. He loves her too, then. Who knows what the clocksmith loves? Best not to ask. I think the answer would please no one. The Rat King vanished, his pink tail slithering behind him. May I say, that is an aggressive voice. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Clara tried to stay away. She managed it for a night. The wine and the guests, a happy distraction. I have to see how much longer this story is. Sweet mother of God. Okay. We appear to be about halfway through the story. Um, I am actually going to put a sticky note in it, or a note in it, a card, and I want to just talk for a few more minutes, if anyone is interested, uh, give my voice a little bit of a break, and then I'm going to resume this probably another night this week. Um, I know for some of you that that is very early, and I apologize, uh, but I also know that that voice is aggressive. <laughs> And while I absolutely love, love, love doing this, um, and so many of you have been asking for me to a reading stream before, I have to break away and do something else. And I think you hear now the strange in intricacies of my voice when left alone. Depending on how I speak um, and how long I speak that way, I think a lot of you have noticed, or at least I have, um, the shift from my natural dialect to my dialect. And when left speaking alone with yourself for long enough, you hear yourself speak a little bit differently. And that's where I am currently. Ah! There's my mouse. Haha, <laughs> mouse, mouse voice. That wasn't intended. So, give me a second. I'm gonna put a tab in this. Oh. Oy vey. Ooh. And we will come back to that another time. I apologize to leave us cut off in the story. Um, I didn't know that mouse would have so many lines. So now my throat hurts. <laughs> Because I knew that that was a voice I could do short term, um, without damaging, well, my voice. However, long term is a different thing. Long term is painful. Um, and that being said, thank you to the people that are still lurking around here. I very much appreciate it. 
So if you're still hanging around, feel free to say hello, throw something in, and it's good to see you, good to see you. I know Slimy is here, but frankly, Slimy is the one person that I believe should not be here because Slimy should be in bed. <laughs> if Slimy is in bed, I apologize that I could not read you to sleep because my mouse voice slightly started to sound like Danny DeVito. Um, <laughs> uh, that bothered me. <laughs> I felt like an unattractive Danny DeVito. Um, mm, lemon cake. <laughs> Easy ways to win me over in life. Lemon cake. Mm. My apologies. My gosh, yeah. Lemon cake. <laughs> mm. I have no sense of decency, it would appear. <laughs> um. I'm trying to look for something very quickly. <clears throat> I am aware that we have some lurkers, by the way. Thank you to all of our lurkers. And we're going to look at, um, hmm. We're going to look at raids, so if you have raid requests, feel free to throw them in, and I'm going to do some FFZ work in the meantime. I'm going to modify my FFZ emotes. Okay. Frank or face Z. Um, yeah. That being said, frankly, I'm very exhausted. And I don't mean that in a rude way. I mean that as an I have a headache and doing a Danny DeVito rat voice did not help my headache um so I think I'm gonna drop it here for now I have a few other things I need to do but what I will do is the same thing I normally do and I'll hop over into my discord chat for a short while um if anyone is interested in talking there so Feel free to pop into what I call the after party, after the stream. Um, I'll talk to whoever decides to be in there for a little while. And thank you all so much. Now, let's see if we can do a raid. Um, <clears throat> let me see. I can't find someone else doing that, but I do know who we will raid instead. So, we're going to raid an old friend of mine, and you're going to see 
um, gameplay. So, everybody, thank you for coming. It was a wonderful time to see you all again. Uh, we'll finish that story another time. And raid! <laughs> Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I will see you all.